Hey everyone, how's it going? So, we had a little issue here at the house, uh, especially with my garage. So, I'm going to show you what's going on. Nothing devastating. Um, a little costly, but nothing devastating. I'm going to show you what's going on. So, here's the inside of the garage right now. I don't know if any of you know what's what happened here and why this is like this. I'm starting to uh, put some pictures and stuff up on the walls of your guys' stuff. But anyway, you get the general idea all the way around. Everything's packed under or on top of the car. On this side, everything is packed in the center. I had to move everything out of the little back room. There you can see. All of that. All the cinder blocks down there. All open here. Same on this side. What a pain in the neck this became. There you can see. So what happened? Termites. Yes, termites. The house had been treated for termites a while ago. So was the garage. And the home inspection when we bought the house was good for termites. They had said in the inspection that they believed there was active termites in the garage. So the mortgage company needed to know about this. So somebody else had come out and inspected and said, no, they didn't see any signs of active termites in the garage. Now this was last year. So Saturday, when I was working in the garage, working on taking the transmission out of that Camaro, I uh, got there in the morning on Saturday and I saw a bug on the floor and like I knew what it was, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to think I knew what it was you know what I mean. I didn't, I didn't want to acknowledge it. So I'm like, oh, okay, I stepped on it. I see another one. Stepped on it. I see another one. I see another one. I see another one. It's like, oh, no. So I walked to the back wall where the gray toolbox was up against that wall where I had the hood. The whole bottom of the back wall covered in termites. I was like, you have got to be kidding me. Hold on one second. Sorry about that. The neighbor just was waving at me so um but anyway so what i did was i got a can of brake clean and i just doused the whole bottom wall bottom edge of the wall where the termites all were i did that i knew it wasn't going to take care of the situation but i just didn't want to have bugs crawling on me when i was working underneath the car so i did that and it actually stopped them for the day there was no more bugs in the garage at that point in time so i finished what i had to do and it was about just about two o'clock so I started looking around and I came across uh, Scott's uh, uh, Turf and Pest Services in um, Glen Raven. Uh, that's one of the towns over here. So it's, it showed they were open until 2 o'clock. So I was like, ah, let me call there. I'm just going to leave them a message and hopefully they'll call me back on Monday. So I called there and they answered the phone. So I spoke to them and um, said, okay, well, then I have the owner give me a call back. A bird's nest on top of the lake. Interesting. Um, see, we have those lights like that. I have another one over there, and there's actually a bird's nest on top of it. So later on in the evening, like around six o'clock, I got a phone call, and it was Steve Scott who owns the company. He called me up and he says, "Hey, what do you got going on?" So I told him. I said, uh, "I told him about the termites," and he says, "Oh, okay." He goes, um, "I'll come over there on Monday if that's okay with you, and I'll take a look." Sure, I'd appreciate that. So, he comes over here Monday. I wasn't here, but Meg was here. So, he showed Meg what was going on. And we had, apparently, an active 
infestation of termites in the garage. So they had to basically drill all of the cinder block, as you saw, either from the inside or the outside, wherever was the best spot to do it. And they basically ran the pesticide through everything. And um, they did here and they did the house. They did everything in a timely manner. Like they came in Monday, they, they saw what needed to be done, told Meg all about it, and then said, hey, you're gonna have to move everything in the garage. It's like, oh, what an undertaking that's going to be. So, Monday, after work, I got my side, my garage where the Camaro is, I got everything situated in there. And then I got everything situated in the back room and most of the stuff in this room. And then Meg came to help me with this. Her and Abby did the first garage there. So, yeah, it was quite an undertaking. It took us till like 10 o'clock at night just to get that done. So, but we got it done. And then Wednesday... Uh, Steve Scott and his company, they came out here. They were here for 11 hours. They took care of the house and they took care of the shop. So yeah, a bit of an undertaking there. So, but that's done. Now I can start putting everything back to where it is. I can actually start working again this weekend inside the garage. Uh, now, a few things that I want to touch on here. Sorry, I got a little lengthy there. Um, actually, let me get you in a tripod. Let me, I got to find it. I got to dig it out. It's buried in there. Let me go grab that and then let's have a discussion here. All right, so now that with that out of the way, on to the subject at hand. I have a little cheat sheet here because I will not remember this, and I'll go off on a tangent, and my ADHD will kick in, and we'll go for squirrel. You get the idea. All right, so on that last video about pre-purchase inspections on cars, many different questions, many different comments came up on that. And if you're looking to buy a used car, and you want to get a pre-purchase inspection find a reputable local shop google it google it it's not that hard google it find somebody with good reviews like a small private shop I'm not talking about going to like one of those big chain places uh, unless you know somebody there find a small reputable shop okay now that gentleman who brought the vehicle to me he was never a customer of ours before. He just called and asked if we could do it. I was busy. I was very busy. But yes, I'm willing to take the time out to do it. I spent way more time on the car than I should have, but that's because I was making a video. But that's neither here nor there. Um, if the person you're buying the car from will not drive it for you or let you take it to a repair shop, like they should be able to drive it there themselves. If they're not willing to take that time to do that, the car's not for you. If you don't know enough about a car to look at it and know that you're making a good choice, if you need to have somebody else look at it for you, which there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. If you don't know enough about cars, I advise you to have somebody look at the car. You don't have to, that's completely up to you. If you're savvy enough to be able to look at a car and decide if it's a good buy or whatever, then that's fine. You can do that. But like I said, if the person you're buying that car from, if I was selling a car and a customer said, hey, I want to bring it to my own shop, two towns over, it's, it's a half hour away. All right, well, I'll drive it over there. You know, if it's your shop and whatnot, and I'm, you know, I'll drive it over there. That's fine. You know, if I feel it's a serious buyer, if I think it's just a tire kicker, then no. But if I think it's a serious buyer and I really think they're going to buy the car, I'll drive the car over there. I'm not going to, uh, somebody I don't know, I'm not going to trust them to drive the car. I mean, they'd have to be, they'd have to give one heck of a good impression right off the bat for me to allow them to take the car. Um, <coughs> which I have done that. I have allowed people, I let a guy take, take my car for almost six hours one time. Um, and then he came back and he bought the car. He drove it to, <laughs> he drove it to his shop had them look at it they gave it the green light and then he used it picked up somebody went to lunch and then he finally came back to me six hours later i was like where the heck is my car but he had left me his car so i wasn't overly concerned i, I got a picture of his license the whole nine yards so i wasn't that concerned <clears throat> plus i had full coverage on that car so i wasn't concerned you know was... thankful he didn't have an accident but i did have full coverage just in case um hold on let me adjust this a little bit i realized it's a little cockeyed so, 
Yeah, if they won't allow you to do that, the car's not for you. I actually, for a short period of time, uh, when I first moved down here, I was on the South Carolina border. I got a job at a used car lot as their mechanic. So they had a six bay shop. It was actually a really nice shop. And it was a pretty big used car lot. And if somebody came in and wanted to look at a car, you get that sometimes. People come in, hey, I want you to put this up on a lift for me. No problem. He was a very reputable guy. Nut to work for, but a very reputable guy. Um, <clears throat> and he had no problem. We'll put the car up on a lift for you. You can look at it. Not a problem. Because everything he sold, he made sure everything was right when he sold it. Which leads me to something else. If you're buying a car from a used car lot look at their Google reviews it's not that hard just go online how are they to deal with I have a friend up in New York eyes auto is the name of his used car lot and he is very particular about the cars he sells he doesn't sell junk um, so if, if you look at his reviews he has five-star reviews across the board there is one review because you're never going to please everybody. There's one review where the person knocked it down a notch and it was the most idiotic thing in the world that they didn't like. And he was like, you know, I had perfect reviews and you didn't like one little thing and you knocked it down. But anyway, it's neither here nor there. Like I said, but if you look at somebody's reviews, you can usually tell. Uh, look with the Better Business Bureau. A lot of times if you find a reputable dealer like meaning not not just a used car dealer but like uh you know a ford a chrysler uh, um, a gm a nissan a toyota uh hyundai you find a reputable dealership that's selling a used car usually they'll stand behind their car a little better than an independent used car lot just saying usually not all the time you'll you'll find some very good used car lots out there so I'm just saying, you know, not all the time. Uh, you can find some dealers that are not great. You can find some used car lots that are not great. But like I said, that's that's where you got to do your homework. Um, not saying you're not going to find great deals out there. So that's just part of it. Just it's it's basically boils down to your homework. Um, let's see. Oh, Carfaxes. People always say, oh, well, what about the Carfax? I don't trust a Carfax for nothing. Um, I've seen way too many errors in Carfax reports. Uh, not to say that it's not a tool in your arsenal. It is a tool in your arsenal. But if, if I got into an accident with my car, and let's say I drove off the road into a ditch and I tore the right front suspension out. Sound familiar? I tore the right front suspension out. You know what? I'm not going through insurance. I'm going to fix it myself. I'm going to go find a used strut. I'm going to go find a used control arm. I'm going to find. I'm going to try to find a uh, used fender hood and front bumper cover in color. I'm going to try to, if I can. But now that accident is that on Carfax? No. Nope. Carfax knows nothing about it. So what good is a Carfax? I'm just saying. Carfax only goes off of what is reported. It's a tool in your arsenal. That's it. It's not the be-all, end-all. So that's one thing. Um, insurance companies. Insurance companies, because this was something that a couple people said. Maybe it was an insurance repair where they wanted to do the cheapest repair possible. Yeah? Oh, it's possible. It, hey, Gigi's out here sneezing. Um, it's very possible. Um... I've seen that many times where insurance companies will come in and they'll say, all right, when I ran a body shop, for instance, this happened more than once. What's up, G? Insurance company will say, all right, well, we're going to supply you with a ting tang tong fender, a ting tang tong hood, a ting tang tong front cover, bumper cover. No, that's not how we do it. Well, yeah, that's how you're going to have to do it or the car has to go elsewhere. Okay, well, then you're paying us for the work that we did so far. And they're like, well, what do you mean? That's how it works. 
So we had a couple of times we were arguing back and forth with these companies. Sorry, G Jesus walking around. Arguing back and forth with these insurance companies. And um, we had one one time where I forgot what it was, what kind of car it was, but they wanted to use a, a Ting Tang Tong fender, hood, <coughs> headlight assembly, and then um, whatever aftermarket front bumper cover. Now, there are different grades of aftermarket parts. There's factory fit aftermarket parts. I forgot. Kappa certified. C-A-P-A -A is certified. If you get Kappa certified parts, it's almost, not as good, almost as good as the factory parts. Almost. They're Kappa certified. They're, it's good stuff. Anyway, this company wanted to put on this really cheap aftermarket stuff. We didn't want to do it. So finally we said, okay, tell you what. We'll put this stuff on if that's what you want. But you're guaranteeing us that it fits, number one. And number two, if it doesn't fit, you're paying us for the labor to do the job again. Or the amount of labor it's in, that's involved in getting the body lines to match up and all sorts of stuff. So you're like, okay, they actually sent us a waiver saying that they would cover all of that. So what we did was we edged everything in, you know, with the paint, like on the edges of the fenders and stuff like that, and the hood, knowing full well that this junk was not going to fit. We did all of that, assembled it, and it looked terrible. Like that body line up where the A-pillar comes down, and it, it kind of has like this kind of a fit between the fender. It was almost like this. It, it was like it wasn't even close. The fit was horrible horrible so we had to take pictures of this and send it back to them it cost them more money to do that because they had to pay us our labor and our paint time our prep time everything it cost them more to do that than it did to just let us get the parts from the beginning and let's fix this the right way i'm not saying you got to buy factory parts every time but there are good aftermarket parts that you can get there's a, there's a big difference between the, the cheap stuff and the good stuff there is a big difference and so finally um, one other question that came up there was, I, I, I'm not sure if it was a legit question or just sarcasm, probably sarcasm, but, uh, they said, so you're saying we should never buy a car that was in an accident. I'm not saying that at all. I would buy a car that was in an accident. I, I, it, it wouldn't bother me if a car was in an accident and it was fixed the right way. The way that car was fixed was not the right way. It was a terrible job. My daughter had gotten into an accident where it was an almost head-on collision. She was going up the road. Somebody coming down the road towards her made a left into a plaza as she was coming up the road. It was unavoidable, almost a head-on collision. Luckily, nobody was hurt. Shaken, but nobody was hurt. The other person was at fault. She had a Dodge Neon. Love those cars. She had a Dodge Neon, and the car was totaled. Airbags never went off. Because when she hit, her car is here. The other car was here. The other person turned into her, so she hit like this and kind of bounced off. So it shifted the whole nose over to the side a little bit and crushed in the left front corner. Um... You know, obviously messed up the nose, messed up the fender, radiator support, radiator got busted, everything. I took it to a frame shop that I know, and I had them straighten the frame out and the upper apron and everything else. Now, yes, stuff can get stuff like that, like that inner structure in that Toyota. They get crinkled, and you'll never make them look right unless you replace those actual panels. Whoever did that repair didn't even try, okay? They didn't even try it. Should have hammered and dollied it and whatever to try to get it as straight as possible. That And that's fine, and I can understand that. They didn't even try. That was done. They've stuck it on a frame machine, but just yanked it enough to make the fender line up, and that was it. Obviously, because they never got the suspension or this cradle where it was supposed to be. Um, so, yes, I don't see a problem at all buying a car that was in an accident. I don't have an issue with that. That's absolutely fine. 
as long as the work was done competently. <clears throat> My daughter's car, after I got it all back together, new bumper cover, new fender, and yes, they were aftermarket, Kappa certified aftermarket. New hood, headlight, radiator, the whole nine yards. Uh, I got it back together, and if you looked at it, you really couldn't tell. The paint job was perfect. You know, the uh, inner structure, yes, it had been straightened out, but it was straightened out decently. But you could tell it was in an accident. Sold that car, person I sold it to, showed him what was done to it. Said the car was total. You know, the, the title was branded after that because, you know, it was total. It was a total vehicle that we fixed. The kid we sold the car to, last I heard, was still driving it five years later. It was a great car. It really was. My daughter got sick and tired of driving a stick shift. Whatever. So, and I came across, actually, that uh, Saturn Ion that I now own was the car that I came across. Uh, let's see, it's an automatic, so she wanted an automatic. I came across it. I bought it from a friend of mine who I've known since high school. She told me her, it was her mom's car. Her mom wasn't driving anymore, so she wanted to sell it. Wanted to know if I was interested. I said, sure. It only had 37,000 miles on it when I got it. So, I got that. Now my daughter, she didn't want that car anymore. She had it for however long, so now I got that car back. So I have that one. But anyway, see, I go off on tangents. Um, but yeah, that neon, it turned out fine afterwards. And you couldn't tell by looking at the car. You put it up on the air. You checked measurements and stuff like that. Everything was where it was supposed to be. No, it wasn't a shoddy job. So, yes, if you're going to buy a car that was in an accident, do I have a problem with that? No. Should you have a problem with that? No, as long as the work is done correctly. Uh, but yeah, all right, so that's pretty much it. Um, just wanted to touch on those things. I know I get kind of long and drawn out there. Uh, but yeah, so that's kind of it. And um, yeah, so just make informed decisions when you're buying a used car. Just remember, if the person you're buying it from won't let it go to a shop for them, for them to look at it, you don't want that car. Obviously, if you know what you're looking at, it's a different story. If somebody doesn't want to let you take the car to a shop, use that as a bargaining chip if you're confident enough in the car. So, all right, that's pretty much it. All right, guys, hopefully you got something out of that. I hope you did. All right, have a great day and keep wrenching.